Halo. You alone. Different folks say it in different ways, Red. You, you, you just saying you alone. But there's another generation here that got was trained by saying, I'm so glad you God and you God all by your by yourself. So many different ways we can proclaim him to be the only God that we have to reverence and worship. And I told you before, I'm so glad that this witness, this walk we have is uncomplicated. Because I don't know that I have it in me to be able to worship a different God on a different day. I'd mess around and be celebrating Thursday on a Tuesday God. I mean, that's just how it is. And I don't have to worry about it because the same one I get up and celebrate on Sunday morning is the one that I can celebrate all day Monday and through the week when I get to Thursday and things after hump day, I can still be celebrating the same God because he alone is the one that we have the opportunity to love and to reverence. And I'm so glad for that. Well, it's almost the end of spring break and some folk are celebrating spring break and some folk are just celebrating break. <laughs> yeah, while others are celebrating spring, I guess. It's just, we knew this is, the, the Sunday after the resurrection celebration is, is, is almost like a hangover for, for, uh, for, for pastors. We see everybody on Easter. And then you turn around and not so much. So, not so much, but guess what? The same God who ce we celebrated last week is the one who brought us through this week. And my Lord, it's the one we'll be celebrating, I'll be celebrating until I see him for myself. For myself. Somebody ought to say amen. Just to help the preacher out sometime, just say amen. When, when you see him struggling every now and then, just say, help him, Lord. Help him, Lord. Don't just sit there and look at him. Give me some, some, some mouth to heaven resuscitation or something. All right. Y'all never heard of that one before, have you? Mouth to heaven resuscitation. Say something. Lord help me. Yeah. So today I want to turn to what I think is a familiar passage of scripture for some people, most people. One of Paul's more memorable writings. You really can't go far in the New Testament before you start getting to the influence that Paul had. You certainly can't get out of the New Testament without understanding how significant Paul was to this Christian walk we have. In fact, most of you probably say things all the time that are really quotes of what he wrote because that's how important Paul is. He wrote most of the New Testament, but all of it was inspired by God. But in his letter to the church at Rome, in the first chapter, he writes, I think, his own personal mission statement for why he does what he does. It's found in the 16th verse. And I'm gonna read through to the 17th verse. He says, he writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's a bold statement. For I am not ashamed 
of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And then he further defines it by saying, for therein, referring back to the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Two short verses, I think, perhaps the greatest summary of the gospel ever written. Paul gives a clear declaration of God's power, and not only his power, but his purpose given in the gospel message. Paul starts out in this passage by saying something that might seem strange without reflecting on how far and, and what Paul has gone through. It might seem strange to start out a little defensively. It, it might seem strange that Paul would start out by saying, I ain't scared and I'm not ashamed. It might seem strange for him to say that, but if you understand what Paul has gone through, if you understand what Paul is working and living through, then it makes more sense why Paul writes in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The first thing he does, if I step back one verse in verse 15, is he lets the world know that he is ready to preach the gospel in Rome. Can I give you some background on this now? Remember now, it was on a Roman cross that the focus of our salvation lost his life. And so Rome probably would have been the last audience that was ready to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul declares in verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel in Rome. I've got all that I need and I'm ready to come out and tell all these men, women, boys, and girls about a Christ who lived, died, and who lives again. I'm going to Rome to deliver that message. Yeah, he's the heavenly American, he's the heavenly uh, Airborne Express for the message of the gospel. I'm on my way to tell somebody that Jesus is still alive. He's ready to preach, and preaching up until this point hadn't been easy for Paul, and yet he's on his way to teach and preach a message perhaps to his toughest, his toughest audience. Let me tell you a little bit about the culture in which Paul was trying to minister to. We've gotten so comfortable in much. We've gotten so comfortable in lack of challenge on what we do that we lose sight of the fact that everybody who has preached hasn't done so under favorable circumstances. Even around the world right now, there are some people who will lose their life for mentioning the word Jesus, the name Jesus, there are some people who take their lives in their hands as they, as they tip up to somebody, Deacon Hudson, just to tell them about Jesus Christ. They take their lives into their hands, and we've lost sight of that. So much stuff is available to us that we can't fathom that you can't walk up and talk to somebody about the Lord. Not just because we don't do it doesn't mean we can't do it. Paul was in a completely different a circumstance. See, there's a difference in the law forbidding you and you stopping yourself. Some folks are comfortable hiding behind the fact that they work for the government. And since I work for the government, you know, I, I can't be talking about church at the government. The same God that you prayed to to get the job at the government 
you, you can't talk to nobody about that God in, in, in the government. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I, I realize you shouldn't come in and stand on your desk with your Bible in your hand and, and go at it that way, but, 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 but it's all right if you sit at your desk and bow your head and pray. It's all right. They won't get rid of you at the post office for praying next to the mail. They won't do it. They won't do it if you're sitting at your desk in your classroom and you pull out your bacon bits over your salad and you say, thank you, Lord, for what you get. They won't get rid of you under those circumstances. No, 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 no. So don't, don't hide behind artifice. No, no, no. Sometimes you just got to be courageous enough, enough to do it. The culture that Paul was dealing with was, 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 was troublesome was troublesome. First of all, first of all, I'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why it was so troublesome. The moral conditions of that day were horrible, horrible. Nero was the emperor of Egypt, I mean of Rome, I'm sorry, the emperor of Rome at that time, and, and he was, how do I put this? He was wicked. He was a wicked, degenerate, immoral man and he was in charge of everything. In fact, he was so in charge that the emperor was seen as godlike. That's who's in charge. I, I say all the time that we would have better situations going on in our communities, but we got too many of the wrong folk in the right places. Oh yeah, they're in the right place. They, they're just wrong folk. No, no, they're not there for you. They, they're there for the come up. To get them and their whole crew to come up. Too many of the wrong folk sitting in the right places. Nero was one of those folk who was in the wrong place. And so because... Nero was wicked and evil. He allowed the community to become what? Wicked and evil. It was a cesspool of sin and wicked living. You could get, yeah, it was, it was better than Burger King. Because you could go to Rome and have it your way. No matter what the circumstances were, it was, it was awful. And so, this is the environment that Paul was having to go in and preach. And Paul was going to go into a place where you could do anything you wanted to do, D. You could have it your way, and he's going to go in and preach repentance. He's going to go in and preach holiness in hell. This is what Paul is walking into the blender of a community has got him such that he's got to go to a folk doing all wrong and tell them how to live all right. Everything he was going in there to talk about was diametrically opposed to everything Rome stood for. And so the moral conditions of that day weren't favorable for Paul. And, and then the very fact that Paul was a Jew himself was a strike against him. Jews were considered to be a subhuman race. It's like Barack Obama giving an address to the Ku Klux Klan. Can you imagine that anybody there is ready to listen to him, not because of what he's saying, but just because of who he is, that they're not inclined to listen to him. They didn't want to hear anything from a Jew, and they certainly didn't want to hear about a gospel that originated from Jewish folk from a Jew. <laughs> Think about it now. Some Jews would have been hesitant to share a message like that with their own circles. And here they are going to Romans. Romans who wouldn't listen to a Jew tell them they were on fire if they were burning up. They wouldn't listen to them. So Paul had a few things going against him. The moral conditions of that day were bad. The fact that he was a Jew was awful. And then the message that he was going to preach 
was incredible. It was incredible and, 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 and almost beyond belief. Come on now. When you first heard that, G, that, 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 that God allowed it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and they let one man and his family build an ark, put all the animals on there, and everybody else on the earth was wiped out, you, you had to let that sink in for a minute now. And then just be honest with you. You had to let that sink in. That, yeah, when you heard that a man who had never had children had been praying for children all his life, and then when he gets old, he and his wife, first of all, have a baby, and then God turns around and tell him, go sacrifice the baby that I gave you. You had to say, now wait a minute. Now, now wait a minute. What's going on with this message? And then if we get out of the Old Testament and get into the New Testament, you start hearing about a man who came and walked on earth. And everywhere he went, he left a trail of witnesses. Folk who were blind could see. Folk who couldn't hear could hear. Folk who, didn't, who couldn't walk were running. You said, come on now, man. You're just selling me something here. This is the message that Paul was going to go and preach to the Romans. And, 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 and to top it all off, this man who did all of these miracles died on a cross that Romans built, died at the hand of Romans in a field of thieves, and this is who y'all say your Savior is, and you want me to follow this man? After he dies such a shameful death, and then to top it all off, you say after we killed him real good, he got up. And that same thief that we put on the cross, the one y'all say is a savior, if this same one is now alive, you want me to believe this. Now you, you, you just have to suspend in some respects sense to believe this, and that's why faith doesn't come by sense. No, 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 because what we've been, uh, what we understand is having happened is greater than we can even absorb in our brains. But guess what? Things haven't changed much. There are still people who come in and around church activities, and they still find it incredible that they, these things have happened. It's just too bizarre. I don't know that it's happening. And those of you who have crossed the line and are now believers have done so because the Holy Spirit has illuminated those activities to you. And you now live not by your intelligence, not by your senses, because some of us wouldn't have sense enough to be saved. Come on now. Some, some, some of us wouldn't have sense enough to get up and get saved, and this has nothing to do with intelligence. No, 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 no. You know, some folk just act like they were born without the right amount of sense. <laughs> oh, it's true now. It has nothing to do with your intellect. My mama used to tell me all the time, oh, you're going to go on that one, aren't you? Yeah, my mama used to tell me all the time that I lacked common sense. She knew that was a dig for me. Yeah, she wanted to get done here. Just say he ain't got common sense. But I guess I had given her too many examples of times when all you needed was common sense, and I didn't apply common sense to the situation. Somebody else in here knows it too now. Somebody else on the ain't got common sense boat. The last thing you need to know why Paul would start out saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel is because conditions in Rome were horrible. Paul was a Jew. The story was incredible. And everywhere else Paul had gone, they had beat him up, tried to kill him, run him out of town, 
had smug, he had to be smuggled out of some cities. They had mocked him all over Athens, called him a fool in Corinth, stoned him in Galatia. He had been mistreated and for one reason and one reason only because he kept preaching the gospel. And in, with that as a background, Shelby, he stands up in verse 16. He said, I'm still not ashamed to go to Rome and preach the gospel. After all that I've been through, I'm still not ashamed to go over here and preach the gospel. Now, 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 now I know, let's be honest, be honest with me now. I, I know why some folk would have been ashamed. T and today, you would have been ashamed. But what did Paul know about the gospel message? That, 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 that made him keep on preaching what folk didn't seem to want to hear. What, what is it that Paul had in him besides a direct commission from Jesus? What did he have in him that made the difference in him keeping going? And the answer to that question is the very reason why you ought to be able to stand up and say, I, like Paul, am not ashamed of the gospel. All right, first of all, Paul knew and it was validated time and time again that the gospel is marked by sovereign power. Sovereign power. The power of the gospel comes from one source and one source only, and that source is God. God, no one on earth controls the power of the gospel. God doesn't need to sit down at a treatise table and come up with any negotiations to exercise his power because he is sovereign. He's in control of everything, everybody, every situation, and Paul worked for God, which is why he can say, with who I got on my side, there's nobody down here who can stop me from doing what I need to do, and that's the reason I am not ashamed to go and preach the gospel, because the word power, we know, dunamis comes from might, energy, force, and strength that dwell within God. That's the power we're talking about. Now, now, now know this, that God could have revealed his power in any way he wanted to. He, he could have dealt with sin in a whole lot of different ways, Richard. He, he could have just wiped men off the face of the earth if he wanted to. He could have just started over. Just, just, just like a child with a, with a, 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 you know, a play toy. If he doesn't like what he's doing, he could have just crumbled it up and started over again. Why? He could have done that because he's God. He had done it before, didn't like what transpired, so he washed it all away. And no, nobody's saying that he couldn't do it a different way. A, you know, there's a whole lot of ways of destroying something. He promised he wouldn't do it with water anymore and said the next time it was going to be with fire, but between water and fire, there are a whole lot of different ways that you can tear up something. God can do whatever he wants to. It's a blessing to notice that when God decided to do something about sin, and be mindful now, the sin that we introduced into the world, he exercised this power by sending men the gospel of grace. Think about that. Think about that now. When God decided to straighten us out for doing wrong, he didn't do it by the power of his might, but he did it by the power of his love. That's what's confusing to people because they think from a political perspective that you have to come in with all your guns blazing. They think you have to come in and wipe the enemy out every time. And what God said is, I'm going to come in and send a force of men, and they're going to love the hell out of all y'all. 
That's why you ought to feel comfortable when something goes down in your life and you feel lack of power to deal with it. You can sit back, rest back, and say this battle is not mine. It's the Lord's. Turn it over to the Lord and he'll, come on now, he'll work it out. You know he will. And when he, when he works it out, it leaves godly traces, which means everybody ain't mad at everybody. You don't tear up the institution when God works it out because God leaves in the wake of his love peace. Oh, that's why when wives and husbands are fighting and they fight in a godly way, they can still get along. It's only when you turn to using the tricks of the enemy and the schemes of the enemy that you tear up everything. God's perfume is peace. His cologne smells good. It's attractive. The aroma of God's love will draw folk. So you need to know that Paul is serving a God who chose to rule by grace and not by might. And that's why Paul was assured that what he was doing was a powerful thing. God could have just sent us all to hell. He could have just done that. Instead, he sent us his son. Sent us his son, wrapped up like us. Put Jesus in man and sent him down here and said, go save him. I want you to notice this that Paul's message is the gospel of Christ. It, it, it's, it's only the gospel of Christ. Don't get it twisted with any other of these gospels that are going on around here because too many other gospels have tried to get in the way of the gospel of Christ. Some folk have jumped on the gospel of religion. Religion. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 that's the gospel that says turn over a new leaf and, 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 and work. And, and, and if you work in the church and you do all these things in the church, then that's how you get to heaven. If you go to church every Sunday, and you do stuff around the church, you hold a position in the church. It's the gospel of religion. Folks see you doing well and, and you dress like you're doing well then I must be on the right track, and it's just the gospel of religion. I, I told you before, there's a big difference in religion and relationship. And too many folks spend a whole lot of energy on religion. There's also the gospel of materialism that says that your worth is determined by what you have. And so the more you have, the better you have to be. The more God gives you, the more he must love you. So if you got a big house, big car, big bank account, God must love you much. I just told you a minute ago where God goes, his aroma brings peace. And so God is going to give you all this stuff. Surely he's going to give you peace with that. How many of y'all know folk who got everything in the world and are miserable in this world? There's also the gospel of liberalism that says, I'm okay and, and you okay, you do what works for you and I'm gonna do what works for me and God will accept us like we are and when we all get up, we're gonna be in heaven. Yeah, no, not so much, it's not, that, that's not it. There's also the gospel of society that says, do like you wanna do because life is short. They make songs about it. It's, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. That, that, that's what they tell folk. That's the gospel of society. But Paul's message, on the other hand, is, 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 is you are a sinner. And if you die as a sinner, Lindbergh, you are going to hell. Kind of hard to say that over dinner. Folks stop eating. Take offense. Because you got the nerve to call me a sinner. 
And Paul says, I, I wish I could tell you a, a different story, but I'm just giving you what I received. That Christ died for our sins, and according to the scripture, he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day. That's all Paul was preaching. It's a simple, simple message. It just lets us know that it doesn't have to be complicated to be forever. People want to make it complicated. But Paul was confident that he was ser serving a God who had sovereign power. He was also confident that his gospel was marked by a singular purpose. Not complicated. You ever seen folk talking and you know they're talking, but what they mean they're not really saying. And certainly what they're doing doesn't fit with what they've been telling you. Because they got ulterior motives behind what they're telling you. They're just trying to convince you to go along with them so they can get what they want. And then it's over for you. But they'll tell you anything in the world. The gospel is marked simply by a single purpose. And if I reduce that single purpose to one word, the word is salvation. Just salvation. That's the only purpose of the gospel. That's why people get upset in churches when we use so many different methods. Because some of them, they don't think, point to our purpose. They think it detracts from our purpose. But I, I'm here to tell you that there are a whole lot of ways to get folk to hear your message. As long as the message ends up with salvation, then I think it's all right. I, I told somebody this week, they were complaining to me about something not going right. And, and, and they said, well, what I tried didn't work. And I said, well, there are other things that could have been tried. I said, if I left this building we're sitting in right now and wanted to go to Montgomery, there are a whole lot of different ways we can go to get to Montgomery as long as we end up in Montgomery. So don't get upset because somebody else went away you didn't go. They got to Montgomery. Yeah, yeah, somebody was born in Montgomery and still didn't know they were in Montgomery. The word salvation is critical because some folk don't understand that salvation means safety. Salvation means preservation. Salvation means deliverance. Salvation in, in, in some total means to be rescued from all harm and danger. And that's why you can safely say that God saved me. He saved me. Save me from a sure and certain death. So the gospel is from a sovereign power with a singular purpose and is marked by a simple plan too. Just a simple plan. Verse 16 tells us in no uncertain terms that the message is going to be activated by folk when they believe. It says it. To everyone that believeth. To everyone that believes it, salvation is available to them. You, you don't have to pay a fee. You don't have to come to this building. You don't have to stand up on a Sunday morning. It's good, but you don't have to do it because it can be late at night. It can be right after your greatest wrong. You can, you can receive salvation as long as you believe. Didn't lay any of those. It's a simple, simple plan. Some folk tell you you got to walk down the aisle and you got to do some side strata hop or something else. But it's simple. And too often we complicate the plan of salvation with all of our addendums. It doesn't require any, any of that. Salvation is the product of faith and faith alone. Salvation comes when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you believe in him having lived, when you believe in him having died, and when you believe that he was resurrected and lives again, salvation is the byproduct. That's why a whole lot of folks stumble. 
Because people like to do stuff for themselves. Folk like to tell you, I got up and got saved. When I got tired of living out there in the world, I came on in the church. And I've been in the church ever since. They got to put some me in salvation. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you didn't have anything to do with your salvation. Because Christ saved us when we were without strength to save ourselves. So this sovereign power sent us a simple plan for his single purpose. And I got to tell you this, the gospel is marked by a solemn pledge. Solemn pledge. Yeah. It's, it's for every person in the world. And the pledge of the gospel is that anyone who hears the message and sees their need of salvation and comes to Christ by faith will be saved. Will be saved. My Lord, have you ever had an experience where you followed every rule they told you to follow? You did every single thing they told you to do, and when it came time to get your reward or to get your prize, they had run out. Or they came up with something that you had not done, that was not written, the rules had changed, and after all you had done, you came up empty-handed. Yeah. This, this makes people jaded. Yeah, and that's why your salvation is not based on what you do. It's based on what you believe. And it's solemnly pledged to you that if you believe, you will. Don't say you might. Throughout scripture, there, there is no variance in it. There is only absolute certainty that if you believe, you shall be saved. And the scripture says that, 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 that the gospel was given to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Don't, don't let that confuse you. That shouldn't bother you at all because God didn't give the gospel to the Jew first in reference to priority. That, 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 that wasn't the reason. God gave the gospel to the Jew first in reference to time. I'm here. I started out here. I was born here among the Jews. And so charity begins at home. And then it spreads abroad. That's what it means when he says to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. He had been dealing with them Jewish folk for thousands of years. Makes sense that he would start out getting them together. But guess what? They rejected him. They rejected him. They, 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 they turned on him. And because they turned on him and crucified him, because they killed him, he then turned to the Gentile. And now salvation is available. You ought to have you a t-shirt that says, I am whosoever. Because that's how we got it. I'm part of the whosoever will. And so this gospel that was given to us, that came from Paul at a tough time, but was backed by God's supreme power. God sent it with a singular purpose. Gave us a very simple plan. God backed it up with a solemn, solemn promise. This same gospel that Paul says he's not ashamed of is marked by a supreme payoff. You've never invested in anything that's going to give you a return like you're investing in the gospel. I'm telling you the returns are out of this world. Not only that, they keep on giving forever and ever and ever. You're investing in your forever. The moment you believe, you start your forever with God. I think people lose sight of that. I, I know you might have to go through sickness. You may have to go through illness. But what can separate us from the love of God? N none of those things can separate us. Once you become part of whosoever, you might get sick. 
but God still loves you. You might even die, but God still loves you. You start your forever when you start believing. The supreme payoff comes from God because when you start believing, God counts you as righteous. He counts you as, as righteous. You didn't earn righteousness. Abraham didn't earn righteousness, but God took Abraham's faith in him and counted it as, as righteousness. So when faith is placed in the gospel message, and when Jesus Christ is who you believe in in your heart, God takes you, the sinner, and declares you to be righteous. It doesn't matter what you've done down here. It doesn't matter how much wrong you've done on man's time sheet. It doesn't matter how man punishes you. It doesn't matter if you're living free in prison. No matter where, God makes you righteous. What man cannot do by his effort, God does by his power. Everything man looks for in religion is not going to work. But God gives you everything you hope for. Uh oh yeah, when you just work the religion angle, it's not going to work. But when you come to God in faith, you get everything you were looking for and more. And so God allows Paul to write in this passage that it goes from faith to faith. What does that mean? From faith to faith. See, some things in Scripture seem so complicated, but, but, but I need you to know that it's not really that complicated. It, it simply means that there were folk from you, I mean before you, who believed, who had faith. And, and, and those folk that had faith told somebody else who was faithful. And, and that person told somebody who was, who was faithful. And, and you're supposed to be telling somebody who will become faithful. And, and so it means that from that faith to that faith to that faith, that's how your salvation has come to you from faith to faith, from your mama's faith, when she taught you about Jesus Christ, down on her knees, from your daddy's faith, to your faith, from the faith that Paul had when he wrote to us, all of those things stacked on top of each other. That's what it means to come from faith to faith, from the beginning faith you have, to the ending faith you're going to have. Faith is going to be the way of life for a child of God. Church, we've been given a gospel that's worthy of believing. But not only have we been given a gospel that's worthy of believing, you need to know we've been given a gospel that's worthy of sharing. The question is, are you just believing and not sharing? Are you telling somebody about this good thing you found? You ought to be telling somebody about how good God has been to you. You ought to let somebody know that what he did for you, he can do for them too. That's just not my job to do on Sunday morning. That's your job to do on Monday morning. It's your job to do every single day to tell somebody about how good God has been. Are you sharing the gospel like Paul said? Can you stand up and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you, can you say that? Isn't it amazing that God would take the most important message the world has ever heard the most significant message that the world has ever heard. God took it, Ms. Daniel, and gave it to redeem sinners. Not, not 
not folk who were born chaste and holy. That, that, that's not who he gave it to. He gave it to folk who had been liars and cheaters and thieves and every kind of evil. And he put, in fact, Paul had been part of a murder. Paul had gone out killing folk just because they were talking about Jesus Christ. And that's who God put the gospel into. God can do anything he wants to do. But I need you to know this, and I'm gone, that nobody's ever been saved except they hear the preaching of the gospel. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it's amazing that he give us this gospel and then command us to take it out, out to the world. Look, 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 God used the vehicle of preaching the same folk. I love the fact that even the folk he called don't have to be qualified. Because if God calls you, he's going to qualify you. I know preachers that couldn't read and write, but they could tell somebody about a good God who could save anybody. Uh, Paul wrote this. He said, for, for what? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Of all the vehicles to save somebody, it's got to be preaching. There's some folk who can sing, whoo, they can sing, but it's preaching. Don't get fooled by it. It's preaching that saves folk. Don't ever get twisted on that. It's preaching. Because Paul told us, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he asked a question, Lindbergh, well, how can they call on him whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him whom they've never heard of? And how can they hear about him without a preacher? And how can he preach except he be sent? Didn't say that he went. How can he preach except he be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and who also bring glad tidings of good things. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. Oh no, it's been preached to a whole lot of folk and they haven't obeyed it. They've heard it, but they haven't heeded it. They've listened, but they haven't loved it. They've been called in, but they went out on their own. The Lord has continued to rain the message down on them over and over and over again. But I got news for you today that faith comes by hearing and hearing only by the word of God. So the question becomes, do you believe? Have you heard? Do you believe? If somebody sat up and told you about how good God is, you know about the story the parable of the man who used to lay down at the door of the rich man and beg for crumbs. And the rich man would eat his food all over him, stepping on it, over him at the door as he was leaving. Never reached down to help him out. And the Bible says that the day came when the rich man and the poor man died. And when they died, the poor man went to heaven and the rich man went to hell. And when the rich man went to hell, he realized then that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his whole soul? And he started begging with the Lord, Lord, so many things he wanted to ask of the Lord, so many comforts he wanted from the Lord. But one of the things he said was, Lord, 
I realize I'm stuck down here, but send one of your angels. Send him down there to tell my brothers that there is a hell, and if they don't turn around and live right, that they're coming to hell. And the response he got was the response I'm going to give you today. God said, I don't need to send anybody other than the folk I've already sent. He said, they got Moses, and they got Paul, and they got Andre Sparks, and they got Charles Winston. They need to listen to the ones I've been sending because the word is already going forth. The only question is, do you believe? Do you believe? Have you heard about Jesus Christ? Do you believe he lives? Do you believe he lives? Do you believe he died? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? And do you believe he didn't stay dead on that cross like we celebrated last week? Do you believe on the third day, that Sunday morning, he was resurrected? And do you believe now he lives forever making intercession for you if you believe in that? then you too shall be saved. Well, there it is. I hope you were blessed by the God's word. It's my prayer that you will grow from this message. But in case you need a refresher, you can always stop by our physical location and worship with us at 7600 Division Avenue over in the East Lake community. I believe one visit and you'll find out that we truly are the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Looking forward to meeting you. God bless you. Take care.